Today we're going to be discussing Edward Everett Hale's story, The Man Without a Country. I'm happy to have Leon Cass and Amy Cass here for that discussion. Nice to be with you, Bill. Yeah. Nice to be with you. Hale was a Unitarian minister, uh, an anti-slavery advocate, uh, a passionate supporter of the Union cause in the Civil War. Uh, and the story that we're about to talk about is, is a product of that context, of the context of the Civil War. Uh, I guess what I'd like to start is by going right into the story itself. Uh, the story uh, begins with uh, uh, the introduction of a character named Philip Nolan. Philip Nolan is the man without a country. But he, the, the, the description that Hale uh, begins with is this. Philip Nolan was as fine a young officer as there was in the Legion of the West, as the Western Division of our army was then called. What happened to Philip Nolan? Actually, as you said his name, it just occurred to me that Philip Nolan is very well named. He has no land. He mm -hmm. is the man without a country. Mm -hmm. So this fine young officer from the Legion of the West is ambitious, dashing, bright, uh, and very, very eager. Aaron Burr, at uh, one point, makes an expedition. I guess it's just after he left the vice presidency in about 1805. This is one of the historical facts that is drawn on in an otherwise unhistorical story. Um, <clears throat> Aaron Burr makes uh, an expedition down the Mississippi and comes to the fort where Philip Nolan is and uh, meets him. Philip Nolan. Uh, basically falls in love with the man and starts writing to him after he leaves. A couple of years later, Aaron Burr returns with an army uh, presumably behind him. And as soon as he gets to the place, he singles out Philip Nolan. And Philip Nolan is completely seduced, heart and mind, to Aaron Burr's cause. Do we have any kind of inkling or any clue as to what it is in this fine young man's character, what flaw in his character makes him susceptible to the importunings of, of a rogue like Aaron Burr? Well, first of all, I, you'd want to notice that Aaron Burr probably represents to Philip Nolan everything that Philip Nolan wants to be. He's ambitious. Uh, he's surely interested in glory and honor, and so is Philip Nolan. He has a kind of uh, physical vigor, too, from that, that, that time on the frontier that might suggest uh, courage and martial virtue. Oh, absolutely. Things that would make, make him attractive. So you think it's his ambitiousness? I think, I think it's his ambition plus the fact uh, that he is really of the United States, but not in the United States. Mm -hmm. In his growing up, he's gro he grew up really in the Wild West. He's a person who had no real attachments, though he currently owes his entire life to the Army of the United States. He's a member of the Legion of the West. Um, but there is no land that he really can identify with to begin with. Unlike the other guys in the base who drink and play cards, um, he copies letters over many times to get them right, to send them off to this man who's won his heart because he's a heroic figure of the sort Philip Nolan would like to be. Yeah, and has a heroism that's that's somehow freestanding, it's free detached from Not attached from, it, from, from anything. And um, uh, even it might have certain kinds of imperial uh, ambitions, uh, which would make uh, someone like Burr's own imperial aspirations especially attractive. attractive. I mean, how could you gain great glory founding the United States? It's already been founded. Yeah. Whereas if there's some other nation um, that uh, we could uh, we, we could get started. Um, uh, our names would uh, be sung forever yeah. like that of Washington and, and, and Hamilton and, and Madison and Jefferson. So what, what happens now, he's, he gets mixed up with Aaron Burr um, uh, and has, is, 
ineluctably drawn to Burr, Burr when he meets them, writes these unrequited love letters. Uh, what next? Uh, well, when Burr returns in earnest uh, and he joins him, uh, eventually Burr is tried for treason. Uh, and then Nolan is tried for treason. But we would never have heard of him had it not been for what he said at the trial. And this is what uh, we're told in the story. Nolan was proved guilty enough, yet we wouldn't have heard of him except when the president of the court asked him at the close whether he wished to say anything to show that he had always been faithful to the United States. He cried out in a fit of frenzy, damn the United States, I wish I may never hear of the United States again. He, he shocked and scandalized the people who were trying him and half of the members of the tribunal uh, had fought in the American Revolution. Um, and so as a result, what they decided to do was uh, to give him precisely what he asked for. Uh, he would never again hear of his country. He would never again see his country. They set him out to sea. Uh, he spends the rest of his life going from one sailing boat to another, one American ship to another. Um, uh, never again, uh, as I said, hearing or seeing his country. Under the jurisdiction of the United States Navy. I mean, he was a prisoner aboard one ship after another. They went cruising for three years at a time. And then when the ship was returning to port, they would transfer poor Nolan to the outbound ship. And so it went for over 50 years until um, he died in 1863, which uh, is uh, the year in which Hale is telling the story and uh, I think of some significance also the year of the Emancipation Proclamation. Yeah. So from yeah. 1807, from the day of his trial until 1863, he never again will hear of the United States. Except at the very Except, Except at, at the, the very, very, end. very end. After the sentencing, um, and he's out to sea, the rest of the story documents the changes that dramatically occur it, within Philip Nolan. Uh, by my count, there are five, four or five or six very conspicuously important moments where there's a kind of transformation of heart and soul. And this starts as early as the first uh, ship that he's aboard. Uh, the sailors are entertaining themselves by reading Sir Walter Scott's The Lay of the Last Minstrel. Do you want to get that, Leanne? Poor Nolan read steadily through the fifth canto, stopping a minute and drank something, and then began without a thought of what was coming. Breathes there a man with soul so dead, who never to himself hath said, this is my own, my native land. Everybody around him saw that there was something to pay, but he expected to get through, I suppose, turned a little pale and plunged on, whose heart hath ne'er within him burned, as home his footsteps he hath turned from wandering on a foreign strand. If such there breathe, mark him well. By this time, the men were all beside themselves, wishing that there was any way to make him turn over two pages. But he had not quite the presence of mind for that. He gagged a little, colored crimson, and staggered on. For him, no minstrel raptures swell. High though his titles, proud his name, Boundless his wealth as wish can claim. Despite these titles, power and pelf, the wretch concentered all in self. And here the poor fellow choked, could not go on, but started up, swung the book into the sea, vanished into his stateroom. And by Jove, said Phillips, who's telling the story to our narrator, we did not see him for two months again. That's the first yes. of the episode. That's here. the first. So, my, my hunch is that it's not only the words up until that moment in the sixth canto of The Lay of the Last Minstrel, but he sees ahead to the last four lines of that canto, which are as follows. Living shall forfeit fair renown, and doubly dying 
shall go down to the vile dust from whence he sprung, unwept, unhonored, and unsung. A man without a country. <laughs> well, but if, if he is that man that we were characterizing before, that noble, ambitious, uh, craving for honor and glory man, he suddenly has driven home to him, he will be unwept, unsung. It, it's the consequence of the direction yeah. in which he's going. He, in a way, for the first time, has to confront his, uh, his extreme egotism. Um, and uh, what he realizes here is that in that kind of uh, uh, atomistic individualism, um, he's in fact going to be wretched. I think what Amy read afterwards is uh, sort of beats him over the head that um, the honor that he seeks can only be had by people who actually have a country that will honor them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but the first point is this, the, this uh, assault on his self-centeredness, which I think he feels amidst this company before whom he has to read about himself um, in, in this collectivity aboard a ship which is now the, the only community he has. Yeah, and his reaction to having himself pinned so, uh, so perfectly. Out of his own is, mouth. Yeah, yeah, out of his own mouth is to, is fury, is to throw the thing yeah. into, the, into the water. Uh, it sort of, in a sense, symbolically murder the poem <laughs> uh, and make it unavailable for others. It's not simply a matter of being self-centered. I don't think he regrets that. Fair enough. What he regrets is that he is somebody and he's going to become nobody. But on the next ship to which he's transferred, um, they have a ball. And uh, there's, despite the fact that he's so downhearted, they apparently need his room, so they invite him to come to the ball. And he recognizes some people that he knew uh, back in the United States uh, when he was once in Philadelphia. One woman in particular, Mrs. Graf. Uh, he knew her when, before she was married. And he asks her to dance. And he thought, well, this is his moment. He looks for an occasion during their dance to speak to her. And what do you hear from home, Mrs. Graf? And that splendid creature looked through him. Jove, how she must have looked through him. Home, Mr. Nolan. I thought you were the man who never wanted to hear of home again. And she walked directly up the deck to her husband and left poor Nolan alone, as he always was. He did not dance again. And you have the sense that that dance again is ever. Ever. <laughs> last this dance. Was the, la the last dance period. Yeah. Yeah. The, the next episode is, um, is, is uh, also touching. Um, when uh, Nolan um, is, uh, participates uh, in a battle with, uh, with the British during the War of 1812, when a captain of, uh, of uh, one of the guns uh, is struck directly by Ken Ball. And Nolan, who happens to be on deck, sort of leaps into the breach, takes command of this gun, and acquits himself with distinction, uh, rallying all the men to do their job. And at the end of this battle, um, he is honored by the captain for his uh, valor and distinction and is given the uh, ceremonial sword that was taken off the mm -hmm. British captain um, uh, and is told on this occasion, we are grateful to you, Mr. Nolan, uh, uh, today. You are one of us today. You will be named in the dispatches. The captain takes off this sword, as I mentioned, gives it to Nolan, made him put it on. Nolan cried like a baby. Um, here's an occasion where no one is doing what no one was, in a way, meant to do. He does it while a prisoner and an isolate on ship. He's, in a way, briefly integrated into the men. 
he's honored mm -hmm. in a way in which he might have been honored, except that this is a ceremonial honor only, that he gets to wear this on the ceremonial occasions. Um, and so he's in a way made part of the country aboard the ship, uh, and yet in a way that reminds him that um, how bittersweet this particular triumph of mm -hmm. his is. He weeps because he's touched by the recognition, but I think he weeps more because this is the only recognition mm -hmm. he's ever going to have. They'll mention him in the dispatches. To enjoy enduring honor, one has to have a country. And, 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 and be of it. And be of it, it. And in it. And not that, simply wear something ceremonial. Right. Yeah. But I think, Leon, what's even more important about this moment, the tears he weeps. This is the first time it, his immediate response when sentenced was a kind of braggadocio and laughter, mm -hmm. arrogance, or what is this going to do to me? And it's only at this moment, it's the first time that we ever see him weep. And those tears, it seems to me, say far more than any speech he makes. What? what would you, how, how would you describe that? Uh, how do you the, articulate the inarticulate? Well, there is something special about tears. I mean, is it, is it a vulnerability? Is it a, a kind of admission uh, implicitly of his own failings? of his profound regrets? I mean, how, how would you try to put that into words, uh, what, what those tears I signify? Think, I think tears come unbidden. They come from within. It's the heart speaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if all of those things you mentioned are conscious and right before him, uh, what is overwhelming is suddenly this is what he has done has touched him on a much deeper, more significant level. Here's the first sign that um, there might be real regret. And it comes at a moment where he gets a um, poor substitute for the kind mm -hmm. of honor for the kind of brave deed for which one could have gotten real honor if he'd stayed a member of the, uh, of okay. the United States Army. And um, I think Amy's right. I mean, one can't give an explanation of it. One can sort of imagine oneself in his soul and feel something just welling up inside of him in this tremendous sense of, um, I gave my life away. And I, I, I love the notion of tears coming unbidden, that this is a loss of control, that the heart will have its way, finally. Uh, what's the next, uh, the next step? In the, the next step is what I would regard arguably as the most important. Uh, and that's the one that takes place uh, on, the, on the ship where they have uh, herded these people to become slaves. The slave schooner. The, the ship that he's on encounters right. this other ship, which uh, this is after we have signed the uh, uh, treaty uh, against the further uh, importation uh, and trading of slaves. So the American naval vessel comes upon this ship. I don't know whose flag it's sailing. Uh, perhaps Portuguese, I don't know. But um, they're, they're faring African slaves, uh, and we don't know where. And the American ship arrests them boards it, um, tries to tell the slaves that they're free, but nobody understands a word. And uh, the captain calls out for, does anybody here know Portuguese? And it turns out Nolan, of course, is the only person aboard the naval vessel who, uh, who knows Portuguese. So they put him in a little boat, and he goes, he goes down to the, uh, to the slave ship. And he translates. And he's the one who actually is, a, is able to tell uh, the, the Africans in a language that they understand that they are now free. Um, and then, uh, delighted as they are, they now put in another request that the captain should take them home. Take us home. Take, take us to our country. Take us to our own house. Take us to our own pickaninnies and our own women. 
And then one says he has a father and a mother who will die if they don't see them. The other ones say he left his people sick and went for medicine and was sort of picked up, et cetera, et cetera. And another one, has, you know, has heard, people at home haven't heard from him for six months while he's been locked up. And it says that Nolan choked out those, were those last words. Right. Yeah, and so everybody clearly... palpably feels and sees his agony. Uh, the captain decides that he's going to take them home. Tell them, yes, yes, yes. Tell them they shall go to the mountains of the moon if they will. If I sail the schooner through the great white desert, they shall go home. That's the captain. After some fashion, Nolan said so. <laughs> and then they all fell to kissing him again and wanted to rub his nose with theirs. And he can't take it. He asks to leave, and he leaves abruptly with this young Fred Ingham. And this is the speech, I think, that reveals really what he comes to long for and what the real transformation of soul then is. Youngster, let that show you what it is to be without a family, without a home, and without a country. And if you are ever tempted to say a word or to do a thing that shall put a bar between you and your family, your home, and your country, pray God in his mercy to take you that instant home to his own heaven. Stick, to, stick by your family, boy. Forget you have a self while you do everything for them. Think of your home, boy. Write and send and talk about it. Let it be nearer and nearer to your thought the farther you have to travel from it and rush back to it when you are free as that poor black slave is doing now. And for your country, boy, and the words rattled in his throat, and for that flag, as he pointed to the ship, never dream a dream but of serving her as she bids you, though the service carry you through a thousand hells. No matter what happens to you, no more matter who flatters you or who abuses you, never look at another flag, never let a night pass, but you pray God to bless that flag. Remember, boy, that behind all these men you have to do with, behind officers and government and people even, there is the country herself, your country, and that you belong to her as you belong to your own mother. Stand by her, boy, as you would stand by your mother if those devils there had got a hold of her today. And then he concludes, oh, if anybody had said so to me when, when I, I was, was of your, your age. age. Yes. I mean, one of the things I'm struck by is how uh, it conflates, brings together so many things. I mean, you begin with the, the liberation of the slaves, of that very uh, elemental for us as Americans notion of freedom, uh, freedom as opposed to bondage, uh, personhood as opposed to being chattel property. Um, but then you go to uh, other considerations that, that arise when the slaves say, we don't just want to be free, we want to go home. Uh, so, uh, and, and home means family, home means place, home means kinship, home means all of these other things, uh, including the flag, including the symbols of nationhood, but, but all the way down to mother, one wonders whether or not um, this expresses some kind of deep human need to belong to all of those things. And a Frenchman, in his circumstance, could make the same kind of speech, and a, a German or an Italian, the same. Um, or uh, is there something different about um, Philip yeah. Nolan's longings from the desire of the freed African slaves who want literally to go home to their kin. All of those speeches are about um, children, wives, parents, uh, people that are missing. Uh, there's no talk about the flag there. Um, uh, at, that, that's, I think, neither here nor there. Nolan does speak about the flag. But the question is whether th these are universal human longings or whether Nolan has acquired at this stage 
something of a beginning feel of a longing for America as a place that might give rise to additional longings, whether it's more than just the love of your own, more than the love of what is natively yours. Um, is there something in the speech itself which makes you say that the longings that he has at this moment are really different from the longings of those free, now freed black men? Well, I would say um, I'm, I'm grasping at subtle things, and I'm not sure that it's there. At least at this stage, we don't know more. Uh, we haven't yet visited him in his stateroom got, on his deathbed, yeah, we got one more episode. where we where we where we see um, most deeply into how he has li lived his life. But somewhat anachronistically, Nolan has been, by virtue of knowing more than English, which is to say, being a man of the world and knowing Portuguese, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is able to play Abraham Lincoln to these slaves in the year of the emancipation, told in the year of the Emancipation mm -hmm. Proclamation, mm -hmm. not enacted in the year of the Emancipation Proclamation. Here is Nolan, um, as far as the slaves are concerned, um, the um, universally speaking representative of the United States, giving them their freedom. And he does this um, partly because he knows Portuguese, but partly because he's aboard a ship bearing the flag of the United States, which at least at this stage in our checkered history has made uh, not the final by any means, but a major step in the direction ultimately of the elimination of slavery. It's, it's a, it's, I mean, the mm -hmm. Civil War has to take care of that. But um, so, so no one has been put in the position of embodying the American principle of freedom and the American principle of equality, and in fact is, receives adulation from these people. Which he feels unworthy of. Which, which, which he f feels, feels un, un, unworthy of. He can't, you know, that's not the part that bothers him. It's the, the part that makes him really unhappy is then the talk of home. So that here he's, in a way, been the impersonator of the American principles, and yet he is not at home to be of them. So that when he then says, behind the country and behind the officers, there is the flag, there might be some kind of sense that um, this country, this country that you, Ingham, also belong to, never turn your back on this country and never besmirch this flag. So I, I, I'd like to say that there's some hint of that in here, and it at least raises the larger question, which we can talk about, I, Amy, I think, wants in on this, but um, whether, um, whether there isn't um, something special about American love of country that goes beyond loving it just because it's yours? Or what's the relation between loving it because it's yours and loving be it because of what's good about it? I completely agree. This is a kind of Lincoln-esque moment. So he is, in fact, doing what Lincoln did. But is there something in the speech that he makes? That he makes? That makes you think, we're conscious of that. Right. We can bring the Americanism to it. But do you think simply because he says, and of the flag, that he is suddenly conscious? Or does it take, you're having to go into his stateroom and look at the shrine that he's erected to confirm that? I'm persuaded that there's something to this sort of Lincolnian moment, as you've both the, described it, of, uh, of him even though in some ways he's a fraud in doing so, because he, he, he is the one, one person aboard his ship that cannot represent the United States. Exactly. It's, it's, but I, 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 think, I think there's a real conflation of uh, the love of your own and the love of what's good or the love of what's American in this case. And I think in that speech, which he says with 
trembling. Um, and great, great emotion. I think what's really driven home to him is uh, the depth of his crime. And it's conflated for him because we see it on his deathbed. As he is dying, what is he clutching in his hand? He's clutching his father's badge of the Order of Cincinnati. That's a badge that is only given to people who fought in the American Revolution. So he, in his treason with respect to his country, is, in his case, also tantamount to patricide. Yeah, it's a treason against his family. It's a treason against his family, his flag, his country. We're told in, in this, uh, this ultimate scene uh, uh, that, uh, as you've said, he, he, Nolan has made his stateroom into a kind of private shrine uh, to the United States. And, there, and we see a great mixing really for the first time of secular and religious imagery. We have uh, a Bible, we have uh, readings from orders of prayer, Presbyterian and Episcopal. Uh, so it really is a kind of entrance into the civil religion in a profound way. One of the things that you learn, I think, very, very vividly is when he said he doesn't want to hear of the United States again. I guess the counter to that is speaking of the United States again. Yeah. And what we learn is how he has been yearning all these years to speak about the United States. In effect, he's been talking to himself. He's been talking to himself, exactly. Yeah. Why does it turn out to be the case that having the United States never being spoken of in his presence turns out to be such a searing punishment for him? Um, when you speak, you call something into being. You give it a kind of shape and meaning that it otherwise has only inside your own head. Speech is something that you use to communicate with other people so that the thing that is spoken about then has a kind of definition, has a kind of shape, has a kind of meaning that it doesn't necessarily have when it's simply in your imagination mm -hmm. or inside your thought. If we were doing this in Greek, we would be able to say um, that uh, Winged words. Well, I was going to take the notion of logos, which is, on the one hand, and this is true of speech in general, on the one hand, um, speech speaking communication. On the other hand, the Greek word for speech, logos, also means reason. And that means articulation, definition, attempt to capture the way things are. When you speak about things, you um, are on the one hand communicating and creating a community amongst fellow speakers as we are modeling, I hope, here. On the other hand, there is also the content of the things spoken of about which we are trying to gain understanding, to give reality to, to get clarity about. But so much of uh, the way we understand who we are in the world in which we live comes through the efforts to articulate it in language. And um, so much of who we are is also built up in terms of the memories of who we have been and who the people we love have been and the world we live in. Uh, the now is fleeting, um, but who we are is built up over ages, decades, and in our case, several hundred years. And speech is the vehicle uh, of memory. Mm -hmm speech and song and story, all of that is lost to a person who cannot speak of home. Um, the punishment, even if he were in the midst of everybody else, uh, would be to make him homeless.
when you speak, and Homer calls words winged words, it suggests that it, it prompts you to ask, well, what, it, what does that mean to say that words have wings? Where is a conversation when you have a conversation? Where do the words go mm -hmm. when they flee from my mouth to your head? The conversation is right here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what we have in common. That's what speech allows you to do, to provide and to give shape to that common ground and eventually to those memories. It, it, it creates a sort of public world in a exactly. sense. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is the, really the basis of that, that public world. And when you lack that, um, you're lost in the fantasies of an inner life that may be completely unhinged or detached from anything real. I mean, Amy had said, and I think she, she was right to say it, that Nolan spent the rest of his life literally and figuratively at sea. But I would add a qualification. He actually spent his life not on the ocean as such, but in a little microcosm of the United States. Mm -hmm. Everybody else was of the United States, in the service of the United States, and yet by not allowing anybody to talk of the United States in his presence, both he and they were denied the, the access to the ground of what it was that they were putting together. Mm -hmm. That it was um, that it was a, it came at a cost to others if people don't have their memories and are not allowed to articulate them. Mm -hmm. uh, and people they, they were they were sort of compassionate toward him. They didn't feel he should eat alone, so they let him come. But it was at a huge cost to have no one at the table because all the things that human beings and society want to talk about, and especially the things of home, were taboo. Yes, that's one thing I think about in reading the story, which is a very understated story in many ways, is, is imagine the, 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 the difficulty. This was a cruel and unusual punishment for, for Nolan, but it was for everybody else. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because all the clipping of newspapers right. and the selection of the, the, the bibliography of what he could, could approach. Yeah, it, it's, um, they allowed him to speak only about universal things. Mm -hmm. So he teaches Fred Ingham, for example, mathematics. This goes back slightly to something we were talking about before. Um, we were talking in a way about to what extent there's something American in Nolan's longings, or in a way about the story as a whole. And this is, I think, a kind of dilemma for America. America, unlike the other nations, are not simply built on shared nativity, on common ancestry. We are a nation founded upon a creed of liberty, equality, uh, the rights expressed in the Declaration of Independence, religious freedom, religious toleration, the rule of law, majority rule, minority rights, uh, the uh, opportunity to uh, make something of yourself uh, without, without external constraint uh, beyond law abiding this. Um, all of those are abstract principles which you don't finally have to be an American to embrace. And while they're wonderful things and we enjoy the life built um, by living in a polity that's founded upon them, the principles themselves don't produce the attachment. They don't produce the emotional attachment. And um, uh, the question is, what do Americans need in addition to the philosophical principles um, that uh, form the heart of our convictions, what else is required uh, to produce uh, citizens who are attached to the regime, who will sacrifice on her behalf, who will take an interest in doing more than enjoying their individual rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Um, and it seems to me this, this story um, uh, this story, though set in the Civil, in, uh, you know, told in the Civil War and set in the early part of the Republic, um, with its emotional power, I think is, as Amy says, belongs to something of the poetry of the kinds of tales that we need, and we don't need just the speech about our principles. That's, I guess, what I'm fumbling to say. 
No, we need stories, speeches, and songs, <laughs> and, and which I, I think I, I was struck in reading this story and how well it illustrates the, the raison d'etre for your book, that, it, that, that there's a whole generation of Americans who don't know these things. Uh, they, they haven't rejected them. They don't even know them. The young people. When I uh, was in elementary school in the 60s and my wife had the same experience, we read this story in school. Now I, I doubt very much that anybody under the age of 25, uh, uh, one, in, one in 100 would know the story. And uh, that it seems to me is an argument, uh, a strong argument for, um, for presenting this story because it is a story about what happens to people when they are storyless, mm -hmm. when, they, they, when they can't tell their stories, when they can't sing their songs, when they can't uh, speak their speeches. I think what a, a story enables you to do is to get inside of other characters, make the decisions that they're making, face the kinds of problems that they're facing uh, in a way that you cannot do simply by reading a treatise and analyzing it. Um, stories also are especially important in American civic education, it seems to me. And that's precisely because America is founded on principles. And we have to elaborate what those principles are. The best way to elaborate what those principles are are to see people who instantiate the principles to see uh, people who demonstrate what we're talking about when we talk about abstractly about liberty and equality or about commerce mm -hmm. or about reverence or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, the, the only other thing I want to say is that stories more than anything else, especially in a democratic America, give us precisely because we are capable of entering into them, identifying with the characters. They give us a common tradition that we might not otherwise have. And, and there's something, as you both said, very special about the experience of um, sharing a story. Uh, and to share it in, in a group, to share it in a family. I mean, families are rich webs of stories most of which don't translate outside the family. Right. To have national stories is, is extremely important to have simply as a point of reference, even if you, even if you disagree with the, the reading of the stories, yeah. to have that sort of canon of stories is enormously important. It's really our hope that um, this book will find its way not, into, not only into classrooms, but into uh, family living rooms when the TV is turned off and somebody chooses to th read the story aloud and discover that there are as many different opinions in the room about what the story says uh, as there are people there. And then when they converse about it, they might discover something about themselves, about the story, and especially about the United States of America and what it means to be a citizen in the modern world. Thanks, Leon and Amy, for a wonderful discussion of this story. Thank you both uh, very much. Thank you.